When I did my first challenge run nearly three years ago, I didn't know what I signed up for. Traveling from game to game, I've experienced a lot of challenges that tested my game knowledge and determination. But this time, things are gonna be different. I'm going to be doing this run blind, with only my knowledge on Fest and Portable to act as my guide through my first playthrough of Reload, a fitting end to the fool's journey. I'll have to make my own route, discover weaknesses, and create solutions on the fly against enemies that can kill me in a second. This is the story of how I tried to beat Persona 3 Reload, with only the protagonist and his starting persona. <coughs> Subscribe! The journey begins with our protagonist, Minato Arisolo, as I begin my new life as a transfer student at GeckoCon High. But it seems like my doormates are able to tell that I'm not just any high school student. I'm built different. And when Akihiko's shadowboxing session goes bad, it's time for me to handle business just as I always do, by myself. Now come, Orphe! Yeah, j j just don't look at that. Here, let's get the rules out of the way. I can only use the protagonist in Orpheus. I can fuse personas for heart items and Elizabeth requests, but Orpheus is the only one I can have equipped at all times. Whenever I'm stuck with party members, they'll be forced to guard until they're taken out. The run must be done on new game and on Merciless, cause we gotta make it difficult. Very difficult. And finally, the run officially begins on April 21st. After showcasing my potential, I was appointed to be the leader of Seas, and I'm dedicated to putting an end to the Dark Hour. Now our first visit into Tartarus is a mandatory tutorial section where I have no control over Yukari and Junpei's actions. But as of April 21st, I'm officially a free man. Let's talk about Orpheus. He's probably the weakest starting persona I've used thus far. Izanagi is absurd with great skills and affinities, and our Sen's access to Dream Needle is crucial for the early game. Meanwhile, Orpheus doesn't really excel in any regard, and being weak to both Zeo and especially Dark skills will be a major problem I'm stuck with for who knows how long. The lack of versatility really shows in the early grind. Until I get some skill cards for some added coverage, there's not much I can do if I can't target enemy weaknesses. If there's too many enemies, I'm forced to either run away or die trying. Luckily, the tutorial fights gave me the Holy Arrow skill card. Not only can I now target Pierce weaknesses, but the ability to inflict charm will be important to get the upper hand in fights that would otherwise be challenging. And a perfect example of that would be the first Tardis boss fight. By inflicting charm on one of the ravens, I can have the damage I'm taking each turn. It's pretty cool that status effects are still a viable win condition against Tardis bosses. Combine that with exploiting their weakness to fire, and the fight ended quickly. With that victory, Orpheus learned his final skill at only level 5. And thus, that's one Tardis boss down. Of 43. This is gonna be a long one. Let's step away from Tartarus for a sec. How will I be spending my free time? My highest priority is to complete the Moon Social Link so I can fuse Garulu for the Growth 1 skill card. I know it doesn't look like Personas give skill cards, but maybe it's locked behind maxing out a Social Link this time? In order to access that, I'll need to get started on the Magician Social Link as well as rank up my charm. I'll also aim to complete the Chariot Link so I can fuse Thor for the Null Electric Heart item if need be, as well as a few others just to open up my options. Now, I know what you're thinking. To which I say, What part of blind did you not understand? The me of February 2nd didn't know any better! As I return to explore Tartarus, Mitsuru won't let me move onwards without at least one other party member. Looks like Junpei is gonna have to be my victim for the shift tutorial. Thankfully, I don't have to shift to win the fight. All I have to do is let the enemies take out Junpei and- Oh my god, they jumped him immediately! While he's in the hospital, my goal for now is to get skill cards so I can hit more weaknesses and safely fight more enemies. And a big part of that is the Arcana Burst mechanic. In Shuffle Time, there's a chance that a major Arcana card will appear. These provide helpful perks and once I collect enough of them, it'll trigger an Arcana Burst, granting me access to better skill cards. Now, the next boss is tough. I can take care of the minions easily, but the main boss just hits way too hard for me to manage right now, even with its attack debuff. But lucky for me, on my next TARDIS visit, I managed to find the Garu skill card, which just so happens to be the boss's weakness. Even with Garu, it's still a close fight. I have to keep the boss's attack debuff and my HP up at all times while I try to keep up the damage. Thankfully, I can take it out before things get too bad. The Swift Axel is weak to Zeo, which gives me a fighting chance. Despite the boss doing killer damage with Assault Dive, it prefers to use Garu instead, which makes most of this fight a non-issue. I've made it to the first Tartarus checkpoint, and my Orpheus is really starting to come together. In my free time, I hit rank 2 charm and get started on a couple of social links. Trying to balance my time is quite the struggle, 
I need to raise my social stats, but I can't just neglect Orpheus. But Tartarus grinding isn't the only way to make Orpheus stronger. The mall has an arcade with plenty of games to offer. On certain days, I can directly raise Orpheus' strength, magic, or agility by a whole three points. And that'll add up sooner than you'd think. I got the Poisma, Rakukaja, and Aha skill cards. And tune in for Tonaka's amazing commodities. He usually has some helpful items for sale, so I always make sure to check in whenever I can. In just a few weeks, I hit rank 3 charm and gain access to the moon social link. But before I can spend much time with him, it's time for the first full moon operation. And I've got two problems on my hands. For the full moon operations, I'm unable to enter without a full party. So the plan will be to stall until the enemies take out Junpei and Yukari. Party members don't get experience if they're knocked out at the end of the battle. So I do this to ensure that Yukari and Junpei stay as weak as possible, since they'll be my go-to sacrifices for the rest of the game. The only downside is that they revive with 1 HP after every battle, so they'll always be around at least for a little while. But don't worry, this will be a non-issue for the boss. Before that, I decided to teach Orpheus Rakukaja since for fights against multiple enemies, it'd be more effective to raise my defense rather than to debuff attack for everyone. Time to stop the Priestess right in its tracks. No matter what, my dead party members will respawn for the fight with 1 HP. But that's kind of a non-issue. Most story bosses start with a multi-target skill, including the Priestess. So the party members get taken out without having much of an impact on the fight. The Priestess loves to summon minions, and there can be as many as 3 enemies attacking me. But actually, the large number of enemies is my greatest ally. The first few attempts were dedicated to learning the minions' weaknesses, and with the right gems, I can deal damage to the minions and the Priestess while also being able to heal and buff my defense as needed thanks to the one mores. The minions go down to 2 gems, and the 50 damage from each gem starts to add up on the Priestess. The more time the Priestess spends resummoning its minions means less time spent attacking me. Combined with my very modest magic stat, Agi is dealing some incredible damage to the boss. With the full assault, the Priestess is defeated. So close. Now is the time that I gain access to the Elizabeth requests. Completing these can grant me some skill cards, materials, and other helpful tools, so I'll be trying to complete as many as I can without breaking the rules. When I'm not trying to raise my social stats, my main focus is on Nozomi, and with how available he is, I'm making some fast progress on his social link. You know Nozomi, the community may think you're a horrible social link, but I had a fun time being with you. And now, I can get the Growth 1 skill card. What? You're telling me that you can't get skill cards from Personas? My only way to get them right now is through Shuffle Time RNG? That I wasted my time with that THING for nothing? Teammates? Friends? To hell with that! I'll rewind our clocks. Back to the start! Whoa. That was unlike me. Anyways, I make better use of my time by hitting rank 2 Courage in Academics before going back to Tartarus. With the Priestess defeated, I get access to a new Major Arcana card for Shuffle Time, but this one only boosts all at attack damage, so it's kind of worthless. I managed to find the Rakunda and Bufu skill cards, and now my Orpheus can target every weakness except for Light and Dark. Let's try out the next boss. Now, these Ravens have some pretty obvious weaknesses thanks to their names, but these guys have Zeo, and I'm not doing enough damage before they can kill me. It's starting to look like my luck has finally run out. Oh, ho ho, we are so back. I cannot believe I found a medium tier magic card so fast. Now I'm able to decimate the lightning eagles with ease, and the main boss is no threat. On my way to the next boss, I ended up at a floor with a teleporter, but no boss. I thought maybe a tutorial was coming up, so I pressed on, and... Well, that sure taught me a lesson. Since I'm now forced to fight the next boss, I'll just gather some info. This boss specializes in inflicting poison. So the next day, I come back equipped with a Resist Poison accessory from Officer Kurosawa and try again. Now before I can sue him for false advertisement, I'm gonna have to win this fight. Once I figured out the weaknesses, it just came down to a war of attrition. The poison damage takes a massive chunk out of my HP every time I select an action. But poison damage can't kill me, so as long as I keep my HP in check, I can outlast the boss. But they didn't lock me in for just one fight. With Revolution, these guys are landing crits on me like crazy. And even though I can get some crits myself, it's just not consistent enough for me when the main boss deals so much damage and the minions have dark skills. After some failed attempts, I decide to leave Tartarus until I'm better equipped to handle this boss. So after some stat boots and equipment hunting, I went back to Tartarus and Elizabeth scolded me for still using Orpheus? Like, okay? For the rematch, I replace Dia with Counter and equip some gear to increase my evasion to pure skills to avoid the single shots from the minions. Now I'm able to survive the boss's constant barrage of attacks and defeat it. And now, things are going great- oh yeah. The upper floors of Arca are where I get introduced to enemies with Mudo skills, so grinding is a constant risk. Oh come on! Let's just see what the next boss is like. What? 
I can't believe it. Atlas made an enemy that unashamedly targets your weaknesses. And if this thing hits me with Zionka, I will not get back up. My damage output, even with my magic stat being so high, is nothing to this boss. I might be stuck for a while. Or at least, that's what I would say. But on some repeat attempts, I realized that this whole identified weaknesses deal is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Instead of repeatedly using Zionga to target my weakness, the relic will instead cycle through Zionga, Bufula, and Garula. It's not just targeting my weakness, it's targeting the weaknesses that Yukari, Akihiko, and Junpei would have if I brought a full party. Although, having that knowledge doesn't necessarily solve the fact that it still hits like a truck, so I need to find a way to deal damage while minimizing the damage that I take. And thus, I chose to partake in the forbidden arts of Toxic Stall. By inflicting poison, I can guard the incoming attacks while the boss loses a massive chunk of HP after every turn. Just like that, the hardest fight so far just became the fastest. After making all the Tartar's progress I can, I decide to go back to my social links. Who knows, maybe they'll prove useful down the line. But for now, it's time for another full moon boss. Once again, I can't enter the fight alone, so Junpei and Akihiko are on guard duty. Now, remember that I said I won't be using Fuka at all in this run? You know, I gotta keep it as solo as possible. So how am I gonna fight these bosses who swap weaknesses every few turns? Am I just gonna have to blindly guess? Not exactly. I did some testing and these bosses will cycle through the same weaknesses in the same order. So all I have to do is survive for a while and find out what the bosses are weak to during each phase. First, they're weak to Pierce and Zeo. Next, Strike and Ice. By this point, the Empress is already down. Lastly, the Emperor will be weak to fire. Since I can target every weakness the Empress and Emperor cycle through, I can comfortably win the fight after a few tries. It was at this point where I started to feel pretty proud of myself. Remember, I'm doing this run blind on my first playthrough, and I'm managing to figure out all of these strategies to win all by myself. And trust me, things will only get more interesting. I decide to focus on the Chariot and Emperor social links. Since these two arcana favor electric skills, maybe their ultimate personas will help me get some no electric items, like how Thora did in past games. Yeah, past me was pretty delusional. On top of that, I hit rank 4 charm and start Pharos' social link. Now that Fuka is on the quote unquote team, now we're given a new set of equipment and I'm forced to bring a full party to test things out. So here's where things get a little funny. We're forced into this encounter with some weak shadows, so I try to guard until they take out all of my party members. And I make the mistake of getting rid of one of them to minimize the damage they're doing to me. And the remaining two actually ran out of SP before they can take out Mitsuru. And no matter how long I wait, they absolutely refuse to do a physical attack. So to make sure no one else gets experience, I reset and try again, only for the enemies to run out of SP again, but thankfully third time's the charm. I go to the next floor and I stumble upon the Theurgy tutorial. There is nothing I can do to prevent Yukari from attacking and using her Theurgy. So here's the thing, there are three scripted fights in the game where no matter what, you are not allowed to win for one reason or another. But since they're scripted, none of them grant you any experience points and I don't think you can lose any of the fights. So let me just grab the rules, add a small change, and let's pretend this never happened. The Servant Tower boss is where my high magic stat starts to overwhelm the enemies. The boss didn't really have a chance to do anything. After this fight, Fuka not only praises the player for winning solo, but she also tells you that everyone is cheering you on back on the first floor. That's just adorable. The Lascivious Lady uses Stagnant Air to raise ailment susceptibility for everyone in battle. So my game plan is to use Holy Arrow to inflict charm and outlast the boss. I came equipped with the Resist Charm accessory, but you wouldn't think I had it on me based on the footage. Towards the end, she'll start inflicting other ailments, but all that really cost me is time and money. For the Fleet-Footed Cavalry, I couldn't find a weakness for him, at least out of the skills I had. But since he was susceptible to Charm, I thought maybe Poison was on the table. I promise that this is the last guy I'll Toxic Stall. Probably. It depends on how you look at it, like, 32 minutes from now. In my Tartarus grind, I got some handy skills to be holding on to but now this is starting to present a problem. There are nine elements that enemies can be weak to, and Orpheus has only eight skill slots that need to be balanced around resistances, boosts, healing, and other skills. So how can I always be ready to change my moveset? By visiting the shrine, I can duplicate one skill card per day without wasting my daytime. So by constantly making trips there, I can make sure that my best skill cards are always ready just for the right occasion. Since I'll be changing what skills I have so much for Tartarus fights, I'll just update you guys on my moveset for the story bosses. Deep into June, I gain access to missing person requests, and I'm determined to save them all. While I'm in Tartarus, I discovered a bit of a grinding trick. I think floors with special chests have higher odds of spawning rare shadows, and I managed to find a floor with this criteria that also had a teleporter. 
By repeatedly teleporting to and from the floor, I could try to get lucky and end up with a bunch of rare shadow spawns. It's not a 100% guaranteed method, but the results speak for themselves. This is a very handy method for not only level grinding, but also because defeating rare shadows give a higher chance of a major arcana card appearing. Speaking of, with the Empress and Emperor defeated, their major arcana cards are ripe for the picking. With those cards being able to boost all my stats, I now have a way to directly increase my endurance stat by a whole 2 points each time I visit Tartarus. This will be a very long process. One that got real boring real fast. So I decided to start the nighttime social links and max out the chariot social link. Time for another full moon operation. Now this is another boss that has a basic attack pattern. For the first half of the fight, the Hierophant will use Makoga, Doomsday Doctrine, and Assault Dive. And for the second half, it just adds another Makoga to the end. Knowing this, I can always avoid ailments since you can't get inflicted with ailments while you guard. My best source of damage is from Garula, which is making the fight go by fairly quick. The Makokas aren't doing too much damage, so the only real margin of error is if it crits me with Assault Dive, which it does a little more than it should. Otherwise, the boss was fairly easy. But much like the guests in this hotel, the Hierophant didn't come alone. The Lovers has a pattern as well, but it's a little more complicated. It'll start the fight with 6 predetermined skills, and then follow a pattern of Agidine, Sexy Dance, Agidine, Heartbreaker, and Holy Arrow. Once again, I can guard on the ailment inflicting turns and avoid getting charmed. Or at least, that's what I would say, but it does crit and charm me with Holy Arrow. But for some reason, the boss wastes its one more on Marin Karen. And despite being charmed, I'm able to dodge a bunch of Agidines that would have killed me. Crazy luck aside, the plan is the same as the Hierophant. Avoid ailments and use Garula. Resisting the Agidine is definitely helpful to lower the damage I take, and outside of crits, there's not much to worry about here. In my free time, I max out the Moon Social Link and get started on the Hierophant and Hanged Man. I reach rank 3 academics just in time for exams, and in doing some Elizabeth requests, I also got a Nile Blade, just in time for the antique shop to finally open. This was a very helpful place in Fest to get a bunch of great weapons in order to- Dear God, they massacred this place! While there are still plenty of helpful things I can get here, it's a shadow of its former self. Now the reality is setting in that I might be stuck with my weaknesses for a long time. As for Tartarus, the Hierophant and Lover's cards are now added to Shuffle Time, and while the latter is pretty useless, the Hierophant providing level ups will be helpful for sure. First up for the Tartarus bosses is the Aquilocratic Sand. The name gave me more trouble than the boss. The Arcanist Decapitator couldn't really hurt me once its minions were out of the picture. My new sword also has the chance to inflict ailments, and I managed to enrage it for a faster win. The Devious Convict is pretty strong. Its teammate is simple enough to beat, but the big man hits hard. But because it only uses physical attacks, there's a 100% chance that counter wins me the fight 10% of the time. Funny how that works. The final fight is against two partners that have some nice synergy, but once I make it a 1v1, the fight is basically over. A new feature in Reload is the addition of the Monad Doors. These have some bosses I can challenge in order to get some great items and new major arcana cards, so I'll be doing those behind the scenes. I start to fuse some personas to farm their heart items and get to skill card hunting. I managed to find Diorama, which is now my best consistent source of healing, and then I found... Anti-Electric Master? Oh my god, I can resist electric skills now! This is a ma- For only three turns? Okay, whatever man. I order some Tetra and Makara Cones from Tanaka and get shoes that raise my endurance by three points. When it comes to equipment, I usually prioritize items that increase my stats or have a good secondary effect. Otherwise, I just use the strongest available option. With the summer here, it's time to go to Yakushima. And while we're here, I've gotta say, have y'all ever thought about the clashing nature of the narrative and me doing a solo run? There are so many instances where characters say they're gonna pull their weight, try to be useful, and that teamwork makes the dream work. But all it does is lead to so many unintentionally hilarious lines. But the funniest has got to be Junpei. Poor Junpei, man. He's been my go-to fall guy for all these fights and all it does is feed into his inferiority complex. And the one time he tried to take the lead, he got outdone by me again. This game is amazing. After returning home, I'm starting to notice a slowly creeping problem. Despite my high stats, my damage output is not cutting it anymore for bosses that don't have weaknesses I can target. While searching for a solution, I not only find Apt Pupil, but also the most broken move of the entire run. And trust me, you're gonna be seeing a lot of it. Next, I max out the Emperor and place top 10 on the exams. While trying to rest up, I'm awoken by a call for help. A shadow escaped Tartarus, but before I can handle it, Koromaru beat me to it. While I can't say I appreciate the help, I do admire his hustle. 
With the next full moon boss coming up, I'm going to make some changes to my moveset. There's a lot of different builds I can make, but I decided to go with one built around landing crits with Getsue. As we make our way to the boss, we're greeted by Jin and Takaya. Jin and Chidori, they're whatever, but Takaya. He's a solo runner's greatest enemy for reasons you'll understand not too long from now. But I've got a boss to fight. The Chariot and Justice are tanky, no pun intended. Even with a critical hit, Getsue can't even do 100 damage. Now, that's not a big problem when the boss telegraphs its attacks, but when one of those attacks deals massive damage even through guard, being able to make progress starts to matter. It only gets worse considering that this boss has so much HP, resists physical, and refuses to split up. Now, once again, I was doing this from blind, but I sat here for over 20 minutes waiting for this boss to split up, but it just refused to do so. I asked a friend about this, and apparently you're supposed to use Theurgy to deal enough damage to force the boss to split up. And since I can't use Theurgy, I'm gonna have to do things the hard way. After a long war of attrition, the boss finally splits apart. Right at the finish line, the Justice tried to use Hamon to instantly undo my progress. But luckily, I had some homunculi to keep me safe. With just one Miragi, the boss is finished. With my free time, I start the star social link and complete a bunch of Elizabeth requests. In Tartarus, I can now get the Chariot and Justice Mage Arcana, and wow, these are getting crazy good now. Back to the bosses. The Venomous Magus will alternate between poison and fire skills. So as long as I guard on the poison turns, it can't do anything to me. And now Orpheus has finally maxed out its magic stat. After skipping school, it's time for more new content. While walking back to the dorm, there's a rogue shadow on the Moonlight Bridge, and I'm tasked with taking it down along with Takaya. This is the second scripted battle, where no matter what, you cannot kill the shadow nor get killed because Takaya has to show off his persona. As far as I can tell, there's nothing I can do here. Even if I deal enough damage myself, it will not die until Takaya can steal my kill. Not only is the shadow seemingly impossible to crit, but it's starting off the fight with Debilitate is doing me no favors. It's like the developers want to absolutely make sure that the player cannot deal enough damage to win alone. Now, I could just call it a scripted fight and move on with my day, but no. Far too many times I have given up too early, cut too many corners, and left my audience with mediocrity disguised as content. But today, I will not repeat my mistakes. While this fight may be unwinnable, I will leave a mark on this boss to let the devs know I exist and I could do what they tried so hard to make impossible just to make Takaya look tough. I'm going back to Tartarus and preparing for war. Tonight, I'm out for blood. The main boss will alternate between fear and dark skills, with its minions ready to use Ghastly Whale at a moment's notice. However, this area gave me armor that nulls fear, so as long as I guard the dark skills, I'll be okay. I start to climb the floors of Tartarus, hunting down any rare shadows I can find, desperately searching for the skill card I need to overcome the odds. And after a few hours of searching, I finally found it. Auto Tarukaja. And now, with my attack no longer debuffed, I can finally deal enough damage with Torn Shot to kill the shadow. Had it not been a scripted fight, unpeaceful. Look, hear me out, I didn't want to make the rest of the game easy by maxing out my strength stat just for a scripted boss. As Takaya shuffles away, laughing at how he's guaranteed that I'll be getting comments telling me the run is invalid, I vow that one day, I will have my revenge. Now let's handle that last Tartarus boss. The imposing skyscraper uses Zeo and Strike skills. Now while it can hit my weakness, it doesn't do too much damage with how high my endurance has become. The only real danger is when it dizzes me a couple of times, but I can comfortably outlast it. And now, the preparation truly begins. I know what awaits me on the next full moon, and I'm gonna try my best to make sure I'm ready for it. Now that I finally have enough money, I can now buy the Amritite necklace from Club Escapade. This will be my go-to accessory for most of the run, as not only does it block ailments, but it also prevents me from being inflicted with a dizzy status. Riding on the top floors of Tartarus proves to be a difficult task because these guys know Moodoon and can waste a ton of my homunculi, but the skill cards are worth the trouble. I remember that I can buy endurance boots from the antique shop and only just now got the reward for doing well on the July exams. Now my stats are starting to look very good, and I maxed out my agility and strength. If I wanted to, I could spend every night in Tartars trying to raise my HP and endurance. But I'm feeling a little burnt out, so I'll just progress the story. I hit rank 4 academics, save some more people in Tartarus, start Akinari's social link, and max out my courage. With Ken and Shinjiro joining up, we've now got a full cheerleading squad. But this is no time to celebrate. Since I'm still weak to electric, the Hermit is going to be a brutal boss fight, and I'm gonna need to prepare for the worst. 
My skill set is built to maximize my damage output and offsetting the HP cost of Getsue as much as I can. Getsue does some disgusting amounts of damage if it crits, and my setup makes it very likely for those to happen. The first few attempts are dedicated to gathering data, seeing what moves the boss has and wants to use. It's definitely the most complex full moon boss thus far, both in its pattern complexity and difficulty. It has different phases that I can progress through faster or slower based on the amount of damage I deal. For example, if I crit at the start, the boss will immediately start charging, but if I don't, it'll use a Zeo skill until I've dealt some more damage. And needless to say, if I get hit by a Zeo skill at all, the attempt is over. I will die. In order to make the start of the fight consistent, I decided to use the Anti-Electric Master skill card. I thought it was going to be useless, but a consistent start means a lot here. Once the boss starts charging, it'll start to follow a simple pattern. After that, it'll use Gigantic Fist, and if I keep piling on the damage, it'll start charging again while also using Tetracarn. Then it'll use Gigaspark, which as you can guess by the name, does even more damage. Sometimes it'll say that the Hermit is out of electricity, but don't be fooled by that text box, it'll still have enough to use Mazio on the next turn. Now I'm onto the phase with the most reliable pattern to follow. But here's the deal with it charging. If I deal too much damage, which I probably will, I mean the damage is kind of crazy here, it'll stop charging and immediately use Mazio. And if I'm not at max HP, Mazio into high voltage current will kill me. Matter of fact, that's the only scenario where getting hit by a Zeo skill doesn't auto kill me. My moments to strike are few and far between. I try to attack when it's about to use Swift Strike since it doesn't deal too much damage, and I aim to heal when I know it'll spend a turn charging. With some occasional buff attempts here and there, I'm making some comfortable progress. Until I reach the last phase. The Hermit will charge up and stay charged up for the rest of the fight. At this point, I don't know what moves it'll use besides when it telegraphs that it'll use Terra Spark. I try to play it safe and see what it does, but unfortunately, I do get unlucky with its pattern and lose a very close attempt. In the rematch, I started playing risky. I attacked recklessly, but I was rewarded with some crazy dodge luck. Between that and my knowledge on the boss's attack patterns, I quickly made my way back to the final phase. I only know what the boss will use for a couple of turns before I'm going in blind, so I have to make every turn I have count. And in desperation to end things early, I bet it all on a critical hit. But it fails. The attempt was over. Until I dodged at just the last moment, and with one more hit, the boss finally goes down. Now that was a challenge. Where'd Junpei go? While I was fighting for my life, Junpei was pleading for his. But luckily, Chidori is subdued and the day is saved. Time to celebrate. Oh my god, I left someone in Tartarus. Reiko, I'm so sorry! Well, it's either go back to save her and redo the boss, or move on with my life. I'm not the type to dwell on the past. With the Hermit defeated, I can now manually raise my SP. As for the Tartarus bosses, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. The difficulty from here onward is going to fluctuate a lot. While I've become strong enough to handle the full moon bosses by myself, that means that the Tartarus Guardians have sort of become jokes. I can't call them all pushovers, there will be some that catch me off guard or require me to expend a lot of resources, but it's just a matter of seeing if they have a weakness and if they don't, oh well, just overpower them. The rest of September is dedicated to Shinjiro. I know that he's a party member and I should probably be staying away from him, but I just had to see his new story content. While hunting down skill cards in Tartarus, not only do I find Resist Dark, but also Resist Electric. Now if I want to, I can finally have a weakness free Orpheus. The key phrase being, if I want to. I continued to progress through my social links, maxing out Kenji and Mutatsu while telling a child they should run away from home. But before I worry about any consequences, I've gotta worry about the next full moon operation. This fight has gone through some notable changes from how it used to be. Wheel of Fortune is no longer decided by the player, instead being predetermined. I got super caught off guard by its 300 damage outcome, but I made sure to keep that in mind for the future. My best way of dealing damage to the strength is to use Yonga. By doing so, I can make decent progress while also not spending HP to attack. Mobius Rondo is like a super diet Hasotobi, hitting 6 times for weak damage, but with access to revolution, the strength can threaten crits very often. In order to lower the damage I take, I equipped a sword that has counter strike as a passive skill. It's not dealing damage, but it's keeping me safe, which is all I could ask for. After a few wheel spins at the start, the fortune seems to have stopped summoning its wheel, instead preferring to use Garudine. I guess it didn't expect me to take so long to defeat strength. Once it becomes a one-on-one, -on -one, I learned that the fortune is weak to Zeo skills. And while trying to finish it off, it barely survives and uses a special roulette board that lands on death. But thankfully for us, no one is dying to- Oh yeah. Ken confronts his nemesis, ready to take Shinjiro's life. But before he can make the play, Takaya comes in for the steal. I hold his words close to my chest and decide to face the future head on. 
right after I sell his stuff. The Strength and Fortune cards can increase my max HP and SP. They're pretty much the last super useful Major Arcana cards I get, so I won't be mentioning the rest. Alright, we're this deep into the video and I still have a ton of Tartarus bosses to go over. I'll be speeding up the Tartarus segments from here on out. But as thanks for making it this far into the video, I'll let you know that there's a playlist on my second channel that has every boss fight from this run if you want to check any of them out. Link in the description. Like usual, I changed my setup to be more varied so I can test out more weaknesses in Tartarus. And with my maxed out endurance, it doesn't matter too much if I don't have Resist Electric and Resist Dark equipped. I'm strong enough to tank hits even if I'm weak to them, and ailments aren't an issue since I almost always have the Amritite necklace equipped to keep myself safe. The skill cards at this point kind of suck. I thought that Regnite cards would start to give me some heavy tier magic, but no, it's just skills like Regenerate 3 and the group buff and debuff skills. As for my social links, I maxed out Tanaka, but I'm starting to wonder, what's Maiko up to? She ran away to Tartarus? On a dark floor? We gotta go! Alright, now I can max out Maiko and the old couple's social links. But the full moon is soon to arrive, and as such, it'll be time to settle things with Strega. I once again build my setup around doing as much damage with Getsuei as possible, but let's try to make the fight a little more interesting. They're not natural persona users like me, so why don't we even the playing field? For this fight, I'm going to win without my resist skills. We meet on the Moonlight Bridge, the same place where Takaya ruined my run. This time, it's personal. Come on, Strega, hit my weakness. Do your work. Oh my god, they can shift. That complicates things. On top of the fact that they have dark skills to decimate my HP, Jin even has special grenades that'll either hit my weakness or do a clean 100 points of damage to me. As a result, he's the one I want to take out first and... Hold on a second. Do you see his health bar? These dudes are cheating! Well, on the other hand, I'm basically cheating myself. Look at the damage! With all of these passive boosts, Strega stands no chance that they can't knock me down. I decided to use some of my Heat Riser items to raise my defense and evasion so I can better survive their attacks. But that also raised my attack, so yeah, I'm hitting even harder. Poor Jin, bro, he went down in four hits! Well, at least that's better than Takaya. He's not a big problem, as long as I keep my health up and my stats buffed. He likes to go for ailments, which are blocked by the Amritite necklace, and wasted another turn on Megidola. With just three attacks, Takaya falls down. While Shrega takes the chance to cool off, I've got a date with the Hanged Man. I decided to add Neuro Slash and Mabufala for spread damage, along with multi-target boost for some extra power. I got pretty lucky that I could hit some of the statue's weaknesses, and even if they resist Slash, a critical hit will still do incredible damage. But I forgot that I don't have my resist skills, so there were some close calls. But once again, having max endurance is a big help. Once the statues are out of the way, it's time to take on the man himself. He's got a lot of HP, and access to dark skills making him a pretty dangerous foe. But my damage output is still absurd, so I get to the next statue phase pretty quickly. The new set of statues come with a new set of weaknesses and skills, but the damage output this time is a lot more manageable. I also get some amazing crit luck to speed things up. Eventually, the Hangman comes back and starts to use his signature skill, Grim Transcendence, granting him extra turns. I'm getting very scared here, because if the Hangman just hits me with a bunch of its strongest skills, I'm screwed. But for some reason, when it gets a one more, instead of trying to finish me off, it goes for Mudun. Even if it lands, I have plenty of homunculi to stay in the fight. This segment is less me trying to fight and more me trying to survive. But with a couple of openings, I make it to the final statue phase, which was a complete pushover. It's down to a one-on-one, -on -one, but before the Hanged Man can do anything, I land two massive crits to win the fight. Just like that, I've done it. The final Full Moon Shadow is defeated and the Dark Hour will finally come to an end. I'm looking forward to the celebration. I know I was pretty cold toward the rest of Seas with the whole solo challenge run deal, but I think it'd be nice to spend more time with my friends. This is not what I had in mind! With the Kutsuki betraying us, all I guess has to do is fire and the game is over. But knowing that this video can't exist if she kills me, I guess frees us from our restraints and Akutsuki's plan fails. With everything I just skipped over, there's a lot to think about. But there's only one thought on my mind. Can you believe they killed Shinjiro twice? Okay, so the joke is, with the free time, I'll be hanging out with the new kid in town, Ryoji, along with some social links. As for Tartarus, the next group of bosses were a snooze fest. It's more difficult to navigate through this block than it is to win against them. But in good news, the rank 10 skill cards are fantastic. I got Tempest Slash, Zeodyne, and finally found Diarahan. On top of those skills, I also study up on how to have the speed and stealth of a ninja. I don't think it worked! I max out the strength social link and send Akinari off, but he's not the only one passing on. Sorry Junpei, gotta kill your girlfriend. 
See, that's what I would say, but this is the third and final scripted fight. You can do as much damage as you want, Chidori will not die before her time is up. As a matter of fact, she'll fully heal herself at the halfway point just to rub salt in the wound. As much as Junpei probably wants me to give up, I've gotta at least send a message. I open up the fight debilitating Chidori and using a Heat Riser item. After she heals herself, I only have two turns to attack her. My best bet right now is to use Tempest Slash since it hits multiple times and I don't think you can land critical hits during these scripted fights. With a little bit of luck, I'm able to do just enough damage that would have beaten Chidori if she didn't have the developers on her side. Just when things are starting to get resolved, right on cue, Takaya swoops in for yet another kill. But out of pity for how much she suffered this entire run, Chidori revives Junpei at the cost of her own life. Love is a beautiful thing, and while Junpei may be at the lowest point of his life, I think I know how to thank him for everything. But after the date Igis and Ryoji had on the Moonlight Bridge, maybe love isn't for everyone. It turns out that the fall is near, but we're given a choice. We can either live and suffer knowing Nyx is unstoppable, or kill Ryoji and die in peace. It's a very tense situation. So let's unwind a bit in Tartarus. The bosses aren't anything special, but now I'm able to find Null Dark and Charge, which will be huge for the endgame. Since I've done all of Elizabeth's fusion requests, I can now fuse Lucifer, who will be crucial in getting my ultimate weapon, but I'm gonna need some time until I can craft it. I max out the star social link, save some folks in Tartarus, and it's time to make a decision. I could kill Ryoshi right now, say the run is over, and live peacefully until the end. But I can't. Since the start, I've been trying so hard to avoid my friends, treated my party members as fodder, and ignored their cries for help. It doesn't matter how strong I got, it doesn't matter how many bosses I beat, look at what happened! From now on, I won't fight alone just for the sake of the run. I'm fighting alone to protect everyone. I'll take on Nyx or die trying. It's time for the final act. January 1st and the final block of Tartarus is already giving me trouble. The enemies are strong enough to pose a bit of a problem to me, and there are 8 Tartarus Guardians waiting for me to challenge them. With how quickly it can run out of SP, I can't just throw Twilight Fragments at the clock so simply. So my plan is to use the Invigory 3 accessory I got and stall out a bunch of enemies if I ever need to heal up my SP. That way I can grind for as much as I want without having to worry about wasting my items healing. Now let's start the final gauntlet. The Obsessive Sand will seem like a pushover, wasting turns and letting me attack for free. But once it heals up, it starts to fight back with some light skills and fishing for critical hits. With my high defense and Tempest Slash, it was a simple win. The Comeback Castle is surrounded by minions and if any of them are defeated, it'll just summon them back. I swap out Tempest Slash for Heat Wave because the castle reflects Slash. Heat Wave is great at wiping out the field, but the castle takes so little damage that the fight goes on for a long time. The Overseers of Creation have skills to target my weaknesses, so I had to bring back Resist Electric and Null Dark to win the fight. I got pretty lucky that the Appropriating Noble had minions that were weak to strike, but honestly, this boss kind of threw away the win. It has Life Drain and it's taking 200 HP from me each turn. If it only used Life Drain, I probably would have lost. Instead, it cycles between Life Drain, Spirit Drain, and some Light Skills. So I just let myself run out of SP and rush him down when I can. The High Judge of Hell is a bit of a hassle. It resists Slash, is immune to Strike, and Mazio Dine doesn't do too much damage. So my strategy is to throw the damage dealing items I have at it, and then use Mazio Dine until it's over. My ascent up the tower has net me some amazing skill cards. Akasha Arts, Strike Amp, Repel Slash, and so much more. With so many options, I'm feeling ready for anything. Time for the last three Guardians. The Cultist of Death. Three Charged Akasha Arts. The Hedonistic Sinner. Four Charged Akasha Arts. The Genocidal Mercenary. See, now back in Fess, I remembered the last Tartarus boss could only be hit by Pierce and Almighty attacks. So just in case, I decided to slap on Poison Arrow, which does... Well, the damage could be worse. But I forgot to have the Amri Titan Necklace equipped, and I waste a couple of turns confused. Outside of that, it's a long but very doable fight. The boss can't hurt me too much, so it's just a matter of staying alive. And that's what I'm here to do. With all of the Tartarus Guardians defeated, I've made it to the top. But my work is only just getting started. It just wouldn't feel right to beat the game without Lucifer's Blade. However, I'm gonna need a lot of money to perform all the fusions I need to make Lucifer. Thus, the grind begins. On my quest, Orpheus hits level 99 and I manage to grab both Primal Force and Pierce Amp. With enough time, I'm able to fuse Lucifer, but he's gonna need a lot of experience in order to give me his heart item. Since I expected this, I made sure to fuse him so that he'd have growth 3, which will give him experience even when he's not being used in battle. I begin to clear out the last group of Monad bosses, and now, there's only one more left to... Well, 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 look who it is! Oh, this is gonna be great. 
This sucks. This guy heals every turn for a full 300 HP. A challenge like this for one dude is a nightmare. With Akasha Arts, I can't deal enough damage to outpace the shadow's healing. To combat this, I swap in Primal Force and throw on some skills to raise my crit chances and damage. With Primal Force's solid crit rate, I'm able to do tons of damage to the boss without having to worry too much about how well I'm outpacing its healing. On top of that, I can use some of my attack mirrors to reflect his attacks back at him and still net some profit on damage. It takes a long while, but I'm able to... Atlas really gave this dude Diorahan. Alright, I'm selling until it's out of SP. Look, it'll probably only Diorahan once, but fellas, I don't want to tempt fate. Once it does run out of SP, the question becomes how do I do enough damage to take it out before I waste all of my resources? So I took out some pen and paper, and by paper I mean the back of my PS5 manual, and devised a strategy to make some decent profit on damage. After cycling through the same strategy and getting some lucky crits, I did it. I killed the unkillable. Let the record show, I killed it with my bare hands in a persona. I did not need to Kaya to step in during the Moonlight Bridge fight, just saying. And thus, after 8 Tartarus bosses and 3 Monad boss fights, I finally step out of Tartarus. The longest dark hour known to man. And I'm back in. Every night I go to Tartarus in order to get Major Arcana cards to raise my HP. I'm not trying to max it out, but since I'm so close, I may as well try to have over 700 HP. In the process, Lucifer finally gives up his heart item, allowing me to obtain Lucifer's Blade. Magic ability will be a helpful passive to raise my magic damage in case I decide to add magic to my skill set. Hmm? Why don't I just use Concentrate? Because the game won't give me Concentrate! I've searched everywhere! The top of Tartarus? The same place where I found Charge? I've checked every tier of card in every chest but for some reason I can't find it anywhere! Maybe if I could Concentrate I'd upload more than twice a year. Oh yeah! The Reaper! I gotta kill him! I had actually fought the Reaper a couple of times beforehand just to test the waters, but I could not keep up. With its two turns to attack, I was struggling to keep myself alive long enough to deal meaningful damage. But this time, I had a bit of a crazy idea. I decided to lean into a more heavy offense role. I got rid of Diorahan and Resist Electric in favor of skills to improve my crit rate, damage, and physical dodge rate. I didn't expect it to work, and I was just testing out a what-if scenario. All the Reaper has to do is use Mazeodyne, and I'm screwed. But would you believe me if I said he didn't? Yeah, for some reason the Reaper used every type of magic possible except for a single Zeo skill. I mean, I'm not complaining, but I'm just a little confused. Now, I said that the Reaper has two turns, but it doesn't always attack twice in a row. Sometimes it'll use buffs and debuffs to slow me down. Maybe it'll use Concentrate and hold on to it for a couple of turns. And it'll use insta-kills a lot. But the most helpful thing it does is use status inflicting skills. With the Amritite Necklace nulling ailments, this essentially gives me free turns where I don't have to worry about healing and I can focus on my strategy of using Charge and Primal Force for massive damage. But since I don't have Diorahan, I'm forced to rely on my beads and bead chains to heal. I guess it's not a big problem because I'll have Diorahan for the final boss anyways, but between the lack of healing items and the amount of Hamans that the Reaper is landing, I'm on a strict time limit. I either kill the Reaper first, or I run out of items. But I had something the Reaper didn't. Luck. I managed to not get crit once, and landed plenty of them myself. If the Reaper uses buffs and debuffs, I cancel them out immediately. I make sure to use this pattern of using ailments and insta-kills to spend my opportunities setting up rather than healing. And with two more crits, the Reaper goes down. And the irony is just insane! My reward for winning is the Divine Pillar, an accessory that cuts all damage I take in half, but I won't be able to dodge attacks. A fair trade-off for a very helpful item. Now, I'm sure there'll be people asking, what about the Elizabeth fight? Well, two things. If I become strong enough to beat Elizabeth, then I'm worried that the next fight probably won't be very fun. And I'm not sure if Elizabeth can be beaten without Armageddon. And let's be real, by the time I upload this, someone's probably already done it by now. While I have the best weapon in the game, I can't get the best armor and shoes. The heart item in order to make them is from Messiah, which will require fusing away Orpheus, and I just can't bring myself to do that. I grew so much alongside my other self, and I want to stick with him from start to finish. After grabbing a couple of skill cards and raising my HP, it's time to live my life. January is a special month. It's a time to reflect upon the times I've shared with my friends and the lessons I've learned during my journey. I've made a lot of progress, not just as a Persona user, but as a person too. Started off pushing away my teammates, letting them take the fall for me time and time again. But after the times we've shared and what little time we have left, I want to be close to them. Junpei, I'm sorry for all the problems I've caused you. I did the Chidori Revival event just for you, pal. And I even forged a special bond with Aegis too. Just don't ask what I was doing last month. 
We chose to keep our memories, and this year, we're gonna make more. Nyx is calling me, and death waits for no one. I make sure to buy a ton of items for buffs, debuffs, and insta-kill protection, before I head into Tartarus one last time. Tonight, there will be no boss fights that force me to bring a full party. I can happily fight everyone truly by myself. Before I can challenge Nyx, I'm gonna have to go through Shrega again. And just like last time, I'll be fighting them without covering my weaknesses. Time to suit up and settle things. First up is Jin, and the Fuka move. And this time, he means business. He'll start off the fight checking for my weaknesses, and I'm wide open. He's got both Lightning Grenade and Aegon to knock me down at a moment's notice. In order to fight back, I use some of my Debilitate and Heat Riser items to make it more likely that I can dodge his moves, or at least reduce the damage I'm taking. But as long as he knocks me down, he can mount a counterattack by either using buffs and debuffs or charging up. The first few attempts are a little tricky, but I didn't come here to lose. With Primal Force, I can do a ton of damage to trigger Jin's dialogue prompts and advance to later phases. And speaking of phases, once his health gets low enough, he'll transition to using flash grenades that do a set amount of damage. Thanks to the necklace, I don't have to worry about any status effects, so as long as I keep my health up, I can withstand Jin's onslaught. When I do get chances to attack, I make them count big time. But Jin has one more trick up his sleeves, injecting himself with a stimulant that maxes out his damage output but at the cost of poisoning him. Now, this is where I ask you, humble viewer. Does this count as poison stalling if he put the poison on himself? It's not my fault he gave me the win. After Jin goes out with a bang, there's just one more obstacle on my way to Nyx. Takaya. You've killed innocent people, my friends, and probably the run to some people. This time, it's just you and me. Okay, it might have been a mistake to fight him without at least Null Dark. Takaya will use insta-kills more than anything else, and as a result, he tears through a bunch of my homunculi. And that's not even mentioning how much damage he does off of Aegon or Zeodyne. And unlike Jin, if Takaya gets a one more, he's not so generous in letting a chance to kill me slip away. Because of his damage output, I added Debilitate to my moveset for consistent debuffing, while sticking to Charge and Primal Force for damage. Takaya really does not like me using debuffs, because he loves to use Spear Train and it takes a massive chunk out of my SP. But there is one saving grace to this fight. With all of the turns Takaya is spending on ailments and insta-kill spells, that's time spent not damaging me. As a result, I can focus on damage and debuffs without being too concerned about healing. But just like the Reaper fight, there's an invisible time limit. If I run out of homunculi, it's over, and I'll definitely need some insta-kill protection for Nyx. So I try to make the most out of every opening I can. Charge, debuff, and primal force to deal as much damage as I can, while healing as sparingly as I'm allowed to. It's a scrappy back and forth fight. But right when he's on death's door, Takaya whips out his secret weapon. N not that one, I meant Theurgy. Apparently it was supposed to inflict fear, but I don't think anyone noticed the necklace I was wearing. But either way, that attack didn't really do more than annoy me, and with one more primal force, Takaya's hopes come crashing down. We finally make it to the absolute top of Tartarus. One last barrier to overcome. While the rest of Seas takes care of the pursuing shadows, it's up to me to finish what I started. And I came dressed for the occasion. Nyx has had some massive changes from how it used to be. It now only attacks once per turn, has different strategies for each arcana, and has plenty of new moves. But one thing is certain, this will be a long and grueling fight. Beforehand, I decided to swap out Primal Force for God's Hand. While I think that Primal Force has a higher crit rate, I don't want to rely on luck for such a long fight. I also added Megi Dolan for magic damage, and I made sure to cover my weaknesses. The early arcana are all simple enough to get through with God's Hand, but once the sword starts glowing, it becomes a Nyx sweep. The Emperor counters my strategy hard, not only in its damage output, but by also resisting physical attacks. While I could try and God's Hand my way through it, the damage I'm taking is just way too much to manage as is, even with debuffs. I barely make it through the Emperor, but Nyx will keep using Sweep and Sunder for the rest of the fight. In order to stand a chance, I'm gonna need a better setup. It's finally time to put the Divine Pillar to use. I won't be able to dodge, but the damage reduction will be a massive help. As for my skills, I add Debilitate over Megidolon to keep Nyx debuffed for as long as I can, and swap in Single Target Boost over Apt Pupil to focus on my average damage output rather than relying on crits. This does not work out very well. When Nyx changes its arcana, the debuffs from Debilitate go away, but the Divine Pillar is definitely helping with the damage reduction, making it so that I can withstand Sweep and Sunder much better. Now, I can make it to the Lover's Arcana, which starts off trying to inflict charm, but will then swap back to primarily physical damage. Despite the Divine Pillar saying I can't dodge, it doesn't mean that status effects can't fail. And luckily, I never get hit by any ailments, but my progress comes to a screeching halt when I get to the Chariot. It blocks God's Hand, which is my only attacking move, 
so I'm forced to give up and readjust my strategy. Since the build tape isn't working out so well, I swap it out for Heat Riser. Maggie Dolan also makes a return with a slight boost in power thanks to Lucifer's Blade. Since Sweep and Sunder are my main problems, maybe Counter is just what I need to stand a chance. It's time to make history. The Fool, Rush It. The Magician, God's Hand. The Priestess, God's Hand. The Empress, you get it. The Emperor, all right. Since I could get crit at any moment, it's better to use Megi Dolan instead of God's Hand so that I don't spend precious HP attacking. This is where I start using Heat Riser in order to increase my defense and damage output. The Hierophant, God's Hand. The Lovers. Counter is very helpful for speeding up some phases. Since Nyx doesn't always resist physical, reflecting Sunder and Sweep do a good chunk of damage. Also, God's Hand, The Chariot. It follows a pattern of Deathbound, Heatwave, Myriad Arrows, Sweep, and Sunder. Heat Riser is a must to minimize the margin of error, and Megidolon is my main damage dealer. The Justice. In order to not waste Homunculi, I make sure to guard during the Hamon turn. Divine Judgment will always cut my HP in half, and since I can't dodge it, I just attack with God's hands since it can't kill me. The Hermit. Getting hit by a physical move when I'm inflicted with shock is a scary thought, so I start to use my attack mirrors to protect myself. Nyx doesn't resist physical in this phase, so the attack mirrors make short work of it. The Fortune. It just cycles through severe magic for the main four elements. God's Hand. The Strength. Like with the other physical based arcanas, Megidolon is my safest bet, and Counter is a big help too. The Hanged Man. This is where things get scary. Nick starts to use Grim Transcendence to try and overwhelm me with physical attacks and the occasional Megidolon. And while this phase does have a pattern too, I'm still at the mercy of chance on whether one of the hundreds of attacks Nyx throws my way is a crit. It's at this point where I've got to not only Heat Riser myself, but also debilitate Nyx. Attack mirrors are still very helpful too, and eventually it's time for the final phase, death. Nyx will come at me with everything it's got. It starts using Apocalypse, which will knock my HP down to almost nothing, as well as Night Queen, which hits for a decent amount of damage. It'll use many of the key moves that defined each arcana, including Grim Transcendence, and it loves using that. This is the most dangerous form by far, and I'll have to do everything I can to survive. I need to keep myself buffed and next debuffed as much as I can. On top of that, I make sure to throw on an attack mirror every now and then. This is not only to protect myself, but to also nullify any Tetra cards that Nyx sets up itself. Just like most of the fight, the scariest moments are when it goes for Sweep or Sunder. I can manage my way through the rest of the attacks, but a critical hit, especially during Grim Transcendence, could easily undo over 40 minutes of progress. I was desperately searching for an opening where I could safely charge or attack. Between all the turns spent buffing, debuffing, and healing, I didn't have much wiggle room. But after a while, I picked up on a key pattern. After Nyx uses Grim Transcendence and finishes it off with a Heat Riser, it will follow up with a guaranteed Apocalypse. Since Apocalypse can't kill me, I can use that turn to do whatever I like without worry. Between that, using all my attack and magic mirrors, and some very lucky counters, I'm able to slowly chip away at Nyx's massive HP pool. But I can't get too comfortable. Nyx can easily shut down my momentum if it gets lucky, and just when I thought victory was in my reach, Night Queen inflicts me with confusion. At this point, I'm a sitting duck, praying that Nyx lets me survive. And then, it uses Grim Transcendence once again, and Sunder knocks me to the floor. It gets rid of my buffs, and Sunders me again. It uses Heat Riser, but remember, after Heat Riser, it'll use Apocalypse, which won't kill me. So by some miracle, I managed to outlast confusion and I'm not gonna let this opportunity pass me by. I pile on the damage as best as I can. The fight has already gone on for nearly 50 minutes and the end is near. In just a few turns, one of us will fall down for good. Nyx uses Meki Dolan and I stand my ground. With one last attack, I return the favor. Use my own Meki Dolan and defeat the one who cannot be defeated. Despite my best efforts, the fall seems to be inevitable. Like I said, Death waits for no one, so it's time to answer the call. The weight and misery of death is painful, suffocating, and overwhelming. But I didn't come here to lose. This run has been fated to happen since the day I uploaded my first video, and I'm not going home until the job is done. With the power I've gathered, I'm gonna end this. Once and for all. What a journey it's been. 
It wasn't smooth sailing, and I definitely had my fair share of stumbles here and there, but it's one I'm ultimately happy I did. You're probably wondering why I did so many social links that I really didn't need to. The truth is, I did them because I wanted to. I love spending time with these characters, and I wanted to make the most of my time returning to Persona 3. While this may have been a solo run, this couldn't have all happened by myself. I'm very thankful to all of my friends who helped make this all possible, and you, the supporters, for giving me a place to share it. This was a hard video to make for a lot of reasons, and I hope that you had a good time checking it out. I'm not sure what my next journey will be, but whatever it is, I hope you're there to see it. As for now, I'm a little tired. Let me just rest my eyes a bit.